Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jackson, and I am the founder and CEO of Edily, a learning app that's kind of like a TikTok meets Khan Academy. And thanks so much for joining, and welcome to Entrepreneurship Tips, where we pack our episodes full of entrepreneurial stories and learning. Um, and today, we have the pleasure of having Kenny Davis with us, who is the CEO of Action Face, uh, which is a leading AI-powered 3D avatar creation technology. Uh, it is really cool. It allows you know anyone to create an instantly recognizable face on sort of a fantasy avatar uh, in both 3D and even printed action figures. And uh, you know Kenny himself has had a ton of brand and marketing you know roles for companies like Mattel, Hasbro, Activision, where he was a marketing force behind things like Tony Hawk and Skylander. So uh, welcome, Kenny. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome. I really appreciate it. You know what? I'll start off with some intel just so everyone knows what we're talking about. This is this is my uh, action oh, face love that. Uh, bottle. That is fantastic. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would love to you know start by learning, I guess, a little bit more about you, Kenny. Um, we met through actually our connection to UCLA Anderson, and I know that you were interested in entrepreneurship at the at school, and then you know you worked with some you know larger brands for a while, and now you're back sort of running this startup. So I, I would love to hear a little bit about your personal journey to get there. You bet. So right out of college, I started my first company. It was called Latchkey Kids Entertainment. We made reality TV shows for kids. And uh, that was in Austin, Texas. We moved the company up to New York and I became a writer for Nickelodeon. Then I went to business school at UCLA to study you know, sort of the business of entertainment. And coming out of that, I, I became the, the guy who ran the sort of uh, incubator entrepreneurship uh, you know, uh, divisions of big companies. And so over a 10 year period, I had three new brands at three different companies where each time first brand I launched became number one by global revenue in its category. So I launched Bakugan for Spin Master, I launched uh, Skylanders with uh, Activision, and then Furby, the 2012 version for Hasbro. And then while I was at Hasbro, uh, I was sort of running what we called the high tech group. And we started doing 3D uh, scans of people at, in stores to turn them into Star Wars and Marvel action figures. And I saw that the sort of crazy fandom of people going, I, I want to be the hero, or actually, I want to be the villain, was also something that people wanted. And I, I had seen something very similar in my years, you know, at, at uh, Skylanders, where what we created was the ability for kids to take their toys, put them on what we called the portal of power, and they would come to life in a video game. And then kids would, would sort of joke around, and you'd watch this in, you know, the, the focus group testing, and they would put their face in the portal of power because it's like, I want to see me come to life in a video game. And it's a joke, but there's so much authenticity in a joke, you know, that it caught my attention. And I, so I've just been obsessed with this idea that in the future, entertainment won't just be uh, us observing uh, a character, but us being the character. And I, I think, you know, as, as we've seen with sort of online games, um, you know, people have these avatars, they're all dressing them up to make them unique and special. And, you know, only I have all this stuff in Fortnite. Well, the, the natural extension of all of this is it actually looks like me and anybody who sees it instantly goes that's kenny that's awesome so you obviously saw this sort of uh awesome moment you had the sort of joke like you know put your face in the portal of power when did you decide like hey i'm gonna take that next step and build my own thing like tell us a little bit about that story of action face yeah so you know i was sort of running what we called the high tech group at hasbro and one of the verticals that we were working on was 3D printing. Yeah. And um, one of the designers from my team uh, came up to me one day and he, he scanned my face using a wand. I didn't even know what he was doing. And then he comes up to me and he hands me Iron Man with my face on it. Oh and it was the coolest thing in the world. And and I you know I showed everyone and everybody loved it. You know, some, for some people it was hysterical. For some people it was like, oh my God, how do I get one? Um, and so, you know, back in 2014, you know, when we, we motivated the whole company to go out and and, and uh, create these booths, 
where people could become Star Wars and Marvel action figures. And, and in fact, that is what became the selfie series that Hasbro's doing today. Um, I, I then started thinking back at the whole sort of history of the, of the industry, you know, whether it was, um, you know, uh, American girl where, you know, it's a billion dollars a year of girls getting dolls that look like them and dress like them or Bitmoji where, you know, the, the obsession with snap probably would have, you know, fizzled out and died if not for Bitmoji. I remember the Nintendo Wii where people were making Wii characters. So I was kind of obsessed with this whole idea. I left Hasbro, I moved out to Silicon Valley and it wasn't until um, Apple came out with the face ID camera on their phones and I went, oh my God, we've got the technology. Uh, we've got the, 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 the sort of the wish fulfillment. We can do this across platforms. We can do 3D printing. We can do this in apps for social media. We could do this with video games. So I called up my, my old buddy, Joe Biotero from Activision. And I was like, the, the technology is here. He'd been deep in AI, sort of learning about AI. Right. And we're like, let's, let's crack the code. And I, and I have to tell you, you know, the, this has been tried, you know, for a hundred years. It's, we're, we're, the, we're, we're among the millions who've had this <laughs> idea. That's not how it works. The thing is, there's this thing called the uncanny valley. Mm -hmm. We as humans are so, we're, we're so uh, attuned to what a face looks like, and especially our own face or the face of someone we love, that if it doesn't look just right, it looks really creepy. <laughs> And so the challenge was not, can you kind of get a face on an avatar? The challenge was, can you get a face on an avatar where people go, I want to look like that. When I, when that avatar talks, I want it, I, I want people to think that's me talking, you know, even if it's a cartoon and it's clearly not me, I want that thing to represent who I am. And that was what, that was what took us years of bootstrapping, you know, sort of quietly before we raised money and turned this into a company. That's awesome. And I mean, uh, you know, AI has been a topic for a long time, but it's getting a lot of attention right now. So I'm curious, um, you know, with all of the attention that AI has been getting, what are some of the things that uh, come to the forefront of your minds, either that you have already been doing, or are there any changes that you're making with some of the advances that are coming out through things like OpenAI's projects and, and that sort of stuff? Oh, oh my God, we're, we're so excited for some of the things that are coming. So, you know, fundamentally from the beginning, what we, what we, you know, decided was we're not going to try to get AI to solve all the problems with one algorithm. And I think you're, you're inevitably, you end up with something creepy when you do that. Joby was a studio head at Activision where he had teams of artists and engineers where he would, you know, sort of walk through the steps of, of, you know, creating uh, turning people into avatars. One of our other co-founders is Dave Kunitz, who uh, was the, the head of um, action figure design for Hasbro. And he was part of the team that pioneered 3D scanning celebrities to turn them into action figures. And one of the early lessons that he learned was if it's just really accurate, even gorgeous people who, you know, stars of Disney movies tend to be gorgeous, they, they, look, they look creepy. And... Um, and so, you know, they, they, both of them, you know, had spent years before we ever started this company sort of thinking through what, what is it that you preserve in order to make someone recognizable and what is it that you change in order to make them aspirational? And what we did with the AI was not try to solve all the problems together, but to solve uh, uh, steps in the process with different, uh, you know, applying the AI and then, you know, going back to what we call brute force code to get to the end of the process and then apply the AI again. So I think that's, that was, that was the first thing. And then, you know, during our journey, I mean, we, we started this at the end of 2018 during our journey, some of the, the, the incredible advances in AI have given us the ability to start uh, developing, let me just call it the limitless possibilities around your avatar. Yeah. Um, and I won't say more about that, but leave it to your imagination. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I definitely uh, know what you're talking about with the whole uh, creepy factor, right? You there's all these um, profile picture makers nowadays, where you you know put your put a bunch of photos and then it you know creates the profile picture, and some of those have gotten really popular. But there's a few of them yep. that you know your face has like this like wicked grin or like it's kind of twisted or like something <laughs> like that, right? Like, and some of them are really great. And then others are just like, <laughs> not so much. 
Right, right. And it, it's fun, you know, when, when the whole point is just, you know, to see what you would look like if, if, you know, three of them come out a little bit weird mm -hmm. and one of them looks great, you know, that's, that's, that's great. You know, you post it on Facebook and say, look, look what I look yeah, like. I mean, you throw away the ones. Well, yeah. But, but, but what do you do with that? Like, they, they, you know, there's, there's nothing there. And, you know, by the way, the, the, you know, they don't, they don't translate to 3D very well, which mm -hmm. is something that we dive on. So you'll see great sort of front facing, images of people but you know turn it to profile and the whole thing falls apart you know whereas whereas you know i think where we wanted to put a stake in the sand and let me see if I can, you can see the shadows you can see this. the light and everything yeah yeah i mean we you know we really try to capture the full 3d geometry of the person that's wonderful for anyone who's just listening to audio uh we're looking at an awesome mountain biker version of you right that's you kenny yeah well I want to jump into some of our, our topics here. So um, one of the things that we're trying to do with this sort of entrepreneurship tips series is take some core lesson areas that exist across entrepreneurship um, and help new entrepreneurs understand, like, how do you think about these different areas? And we've already actually started talking a little bit about um, the first one, which is love to talk about some customer needs and how do you identify those customer needs. Additionally, I think, uh, Kenny, you'll have some amazing insights for us around partnerships. Uh, how do you uh, build values for a company and marketing, given your background? So let's go ahead and uh, hop in here. So uh, first, let's talk, let's talk customer needs. So um, I am super curious with Action Faces, Action Faces story specifically. Like, it sounds like what happened was the the excitement and the need came first and then the idea came. Um, however, you know, it's interesting because uh, when you're thinking about entrepreneurship, there's often this idea that, you know, you know, not a lot of people would be able to state the idea that, you know, I want to see myself dunking on Steph Curry or something, right? <laughs> like, so how do you think about, like, how do you think about customer needs and finding those needs and, is it just through the process of working on something that's cool? Or I'd love to hear the sort of that story of action face and how you think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, something I wrestled with throughout my career is, you know, I'd always heard that a, a good new business, you start with a problem statement, you know, the, so somebody's having headaches all the time. And so you, you know, you invent Tylenol and now you got a business. Everybody who has a headache is going to want a Tylenol. The, um, the, thing that never made sense to me because I, I began my career in entertainment was how that applies to entertainment. You know, the Lion King, it's what, what an enormous, you know, franchise. It's a, it's a movie, it's theme park attractions. It's a, you know, it's Broadway play. Like you can't say that the Lion King was a bad business decision. And yet you, you also wouldn't start from the standpoint of, you know, people are really m missing out on, African safari movies, we should invent one. Like <laughs> wasn't there was there was a Tylenol analogy there. Um yeah. and um and so, you know, I think for you know, any any entrepreneur listening out there who's inventing something in the entertainment space, if you're if you're frustrated with that paradox, uh, just know that I'm right there with you. Uh all that said, I what I would say is I before, you know, I was I was launching new businesses well you know, collecting 401k and healthcare. So I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't taking the big risk, knowing itching every day to go out and start my own company. But it really wasn't until I saw something where I went, there's, there is a pain point in the market, a wish that is not being fulfilled, an itch that's not being scratched. And that was, I looked at the across entertainment, you could point to a, a desire for the fan to be the star. And I saw this in television, you know, as I began my career in television, every, every producer I worked for said, you know, people aren't watching, you know, the star they're watching themselves. You know, when, when you see Tom Cruise and Maverick, you're, you're just, you know, if you're like most guys, especially you're picturing yourself as Tom Cruise and Maverick. <laughs> when you play a video game as an avatar, you still think it's you. When you talk to any girl playing with her Barbie doll, she doesn't say Barbie is doing this. She says, I'm doing this. I'm going into my dream house now. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And so I just, I've just believed deep down in my core that if you could actually bring that to life, 
people would respond. And, you know, so, so far, so good. Uh, that's so interesting because, you know, I'm building something that's kind of entertainment, but also kind of education. So I, I struggle with this all the time, right? Is like the uh, entertainment side of like, well, do you give people, you know, what they want without them stating it or yeah so i i completely understand this um one uh one of the things that you know i i would maybe ask is are there a set of key principles so for new entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about customer needs like what should they be considering when trying to understand that customer uh, are there, mm -hmm. there are a few key principles that they should think about yes um you know for for first of all you know, get to know your customer and, you know, ask them, don't, don't assume, you know, um, you know, there's, there's something incredibly powerful about being the customer yourself. Um, you know, Steve Jobs at one point said, uh, the reason our iPods are so great is because we're, we, we all needed a thousand songs in our pocket and we couldn't get it. Um, and so he was, you know, it was, there was a, a, a team that was the customer. And so the, the need for research goes down exponentially, like more than exponentially, like the need for research is, is just a orders of magnitude, different problem when you're just trying to satisfy yourself and you know, there's a bunch of people like you. Um, but the, at the end of the day, um, no matter who you are, uh, once you're, once you're designing, once you're making decisions based on things besides what motivates you as the consumer, you, you become blind. You know, once you start thinking about cost of goods sold and distribution channels, you become blind to what's actually just fun or what, what motivates you. So you just got to be out there every single day observing, uh, know that nobody's ever going to give you the answer. No one's ever, you know, the, the famous quote by Henry Ford, you know, if I ask, it's probably not even true that it happened, but, but everyone gets it. It's like, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. You, you can't, you can't, ask consumers to design your product for you but what you can ask them for is their problem statement and you can observe whether or not what you're giving them is solving their problem or not and you know the hardest part is along the way seeing how close you're getting when you're not totally getting there and trying to figure out what's working and what's not um, but anyway the, the short answer to your question is uh, the way to get to know your customer identify who that customer is, um, talk to them about what the problem statement is, and then repeatedly every, I, I don't think there's a single day when I don't scan somebody or show them a video on my phone and say, hey, you know, what do you think of this? Um, and just, just really, really listen. That's awesome. If you could start from the beginning and do it all again, are there any moments where you found you weren't sort of following this advice or where there's like some watch outs where entrepreneurs get sucked into common traps. Oh, I mean, it'll, it'll happen. You know, it's uh, I, I don't know why I'm quoting people today, but uh, Mike, Mike Tyson quote. Again, it's good. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> we, we, you know, what I saw when we started this company was um, that there were people who, um, were actually, yeah, let me, let me, let me, we've been punched in the face so many times. I don't even know which example. To give. Um, I'll give, I'll give you a great example. Um, we, we'd been out in the marketplace, uh, testing our technology and we sort of stumbled upon, uh, a consumer problem that we hadn't even thought about before, which is we were testing with kids, even, even all the way to high school. And we, we realized that the mother's Mostly mothers, I don't mean to be sexist, I'm just a marketer who's looking at demographics. Mostly mothers were going, I need to have this. And we're like, oh, well, that's what the kids were going to want this. But the mothers <laughs> were looking at our, our 3D action figures and mm -hmm. going, this is a three-dimensional photograph of my child who's aging and changing every single day. I've got tons of two-dimensional photographs on my phone, but I wish if I could capture that, that moment in 3D. And so we started working with school photographers and we, we you know, we did a, a test and we were like, oh my God, this is a business. We plowed a ton of resources into getting started with school photographers and then COVID hit. Right. <laughs> what was this called? <laughs> let alone school photography. Yeah. 
but you put that one in your back pocket for later. <laughs> so yeah, we're sitting on a bunch of technology to do something that can't be done. And all of a sudden we're, we, we find ourselves in the, the place where you never want to be, where you've got, you, you now have a technology, a solution, and now you got to go find a problem that it solves because it's not, it's not going to solve the problem that you meant for it. And so, you know, we created this technology that was almost like Zazzle where every school could go in and, you know, in five minutes with no code, put their school, you know, school logo on, on an action figure and, you know, we could sell it to mom. Didn't, didn't have an application. So now we're out there going, well, who else needs this? Um, and I, I think that's going to happen to every single entrepreneur, no matter how disciplined you are at starting with the problem. At some point, you're going to end up with a solution going, oh, <laughs> retard it. What, what, <laughs> okay. Where do we go from here? <laughs> Yeah. Well, also, I think that story is a really great segue into the sort of next topic here, which is uh, around partnerships. Um, and so um, when you were first building Action Face, did you always know that you wanted these high vis visibility partnerships? And maybe you can just quickly take us through some of the partnerships you've had, because there's a long list of very impressive partnerships. But was that always a part of the plan? I would love the story of sort of going from zero partnerships to one partnership to maybe like that whale of a partnership that you always knew was possible, but was still that huge win. hundred, hundred percent. Yeah. So, you know, my vision right from the beginning was that uh, we were kind of Funko pop meets, uh, uh, you know, the, the digital twin, um, you know, that, that, the num and, and again, I, you know, 30 years in entertainment. So I've, I've sort of seen how people interact with brands and, uh, the biggest, one, one of the biggest, uh, re ways that people express themselves is by identifying with a brand. Um, I shall tell you a great story. I'll tell you a great story. When I was, when I was, uh, part of Hasbro and we were putting these 3d scanners at Walmart, um, you know, I thought we were making action figures for kids and I saw a family standing in line and the, you know, the parents were probably in their early forties and the mother was getting all ready for her, her scan. And I was like, Oh my God, I said, I'm, I'm I work at Hasbro and you know, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? She said, of course. I said, you know, I, obviously you're doing this for your kids. Um, but it looks like you're getting ready to make an action figure of yourself too. And she said, Oh, I am, I am. And I said, uh, you know, that's, that's great. I said, I'm assuming you're not going to put that in the playroom. And she's like, no, 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 it goes in the living room. And I said, oh, of, uh, you know, of course. I mean, this, you know, to put it on, on display for everyone to see. And I said, you know, forgive me for asking this. This is just sort of market research. But in, you know, decades of making toys, I've basically never seen a kid's toy that parents want and this could be really meaningful to how big this business could be. And she kind of looked at me like I was crazy. She's like, it's not a toy. She goes, <laughs> Star Wars family. Mm. Oh my God. I, I, you know, there were these $30,000 3D scanning booths that you could go to that would scan you from head to toe. And you look exactly the way that you look when you stepped into that scanner. And I realized we're offering this woman something so much more valuable in a realistic version of herself. She's able to tell the world who she really is inside because she's wearing a stormtrooper outfit on the outside. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, year, you know, years later I, I, I started action face and the thought was it's, you know, it's the brands, it's the characters. People want to immerse themselves. They want to be the hero or the villain. And, and, you know, a big part of telling the world who you really are, is showing the world who you care about. So partnerships for you were like, uh, you know, you yes. had to have good partnerships from day one. Absolutely, absolutely. And listen, they, they can be micro partnerships. It can be your school. It can be your your church. It can be, but it can. But we also sign the NDA. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a just a little brand called the NBA. Amazing. Uh, so I guess when you know, not every company is an entertainment company. And obviously this is super important for y'all, but, um, when startups are thinking about building partnerships, like how, how should a startup think about it? You know, with so many potential partners out there, is there some sort of a framework that you might use to evaluate those 
partnerships that they could make? Absolutely. So first thing I would say is less is more. Um, you know, I've, I've seen so many startups uh, burn through because the, the, the cost of signing the license, while high, is, is a fraction of the cost of marketing the license. And at the end of the day, what's going to matter is that you have mastered one good expression of your core promise. So for us, we, we actually, you know, we could sign at this point many more than the NBA. They've been just fabulous partners to us and, and we've, um, we continue to go deeper and deeper. Every time there's, there's a big NBA event, you know, they're inviting us, they're, they're, they're bringing us in as part of the overall fan experience. Um, and so we've, we've had outreach from the, from other pro leagues and from, you know, very, various other brands. Um, but it doesn't make sense to, uh, to activate until you've got that commitment to, to co-market. The marketing is the most right. expensive part. And, you know, you need to be providing enough value to them that they want to, they want to give you their audience. Cause that's what, that's what, the, uh, that's the reason why they're, licensing fees in the first place or that's the reason why the partners have leverage in the first place is they've already got distribution channels they've already got fans they've already got brand recognition trust credibility all of these things they've got a lot of leverage so until you're truly um adding enough value so that they're they're giving you everything that they've got I, there's no point in going to the next one um the the, the brand the, the association alone is not that much it's the it's the integration that that makes all the difference yeah i love that quote of master one good expression of your core promise um you know be able to show that you have something that's working exceptionally well before um making it repeatable and moving on to the next one right yeah um yeah and and i guess uh at a sort of disambiguated level if you're talking about you know any startup going into a partner, that partner uh, does represent, you know, the the expression of their core promise. Um, are there any sort of key steps that you would take? So the recipe for success, you know, you've identified this partner, you think it, uh, it rings true to your core promise. Like what's, I guess, what's the quick how to like uh, the initial conversation and negotiation phase, um, the thinking about the duration of the partnership for someone who's never, you know, created this before, how should they approach it? So the, the first thing you need to do is, is figure out what do you want from the partner? Um, yeah, that's not your pitch, but that is, that is going to ground you in, you know, what, what, what you're pursuing, you know, what, what, what really matters to you? What, what are you willing to give to get it? Um, so, you know, and, and follow the money, start with the money, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we're businesses. So, you know, is this, is this partner going to help you sell something? Is, are they going to give you credibility so that you can sell something? What is this partner going to do for you that is going to enhance your bottom line now or, or deep in the future? It doesn't matter where, where in the timeline. Figure, figure that out. And then figure out what you what is the least most that you need from them. So you really need this from them. You'd like that. You know, this other thing, you know, probably comes with the package, but it's not that, that valuable to you. Now flip it around. What do they need from you? What and 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 a lot of times it does require research because you can look at you can look at a partner and go, well, clearly they need X, Y, and Z. And then you get you get to know the organization and you're like, oh, there's no there's no stakeholder decision maker who is in charge of X, Y, and Z. There's somebody who's in charge of X, another person in charge of Y, and in charge of Z. And they actually don't talk to each other because one of them's in New York and the other's in LA. So you know. Get, get to know that partner a little bit. You know, there's, you can figure this out. You can figure it out on LinkedIn, you know, see if you can network in. They'll tell you too. And then, you know, really get to, as, as much as you can, get to know their um, their problem statements. What, what do they need to achieve? A lot of times it, it starts with the pitch. I mean, you know, sometimes you just can't get in until you've got a pitch. And rather than going in and just hard selling, you know, start the pitch with, hey, I really want to understand your business needs. This is what I think you're, you need, but you know, you tell me, and we're going to come back to you in a month with a pitch, and they'll 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 do that. They'll do that. So then now now you know they what they need from you, what you need from them, and then as you go into this um, into the negotiation, um, 
you know, keep keep in mind what's most important to you, at least for their side. You get the deal done. All right, now the deal is done. You've only just begun. You haven't even, you know, you're not making any money yet. So, you know, the next most important thing you need to do is build leverage. Because the partner invariably, if you're a startup, your partner invariably is bigger than you and was doing fine before you arrived. And so uh, this is where, you know, and, and let them let them know that your investment spending on their behalf, you go out of your way to prove the value that you can provide to them. And the reason why you let them know that this is, you know, this is a pilot is because you don't want them to come to the fact that you're just going to keep doing this indefinitely and, you know, you'll spend all of your investors' money uh, to, to, to give them an advantage. But, but you do need to develop that leverage and the best way to develop it is do something with them that's that that gives them what they were looking for in that negotiation that you had with them. And now you got a proof point. You say, if you want to 10x this or you want to 100x this, I need you to invest in it too. Mm. Yeah, that is an awesome roadmap. Uh, as someone who hasn't built these big partnerships, I, I learned a ton just there. That was awesome. Um, well, wonderful. Uh, I would love to keep us moving and rolling along. So um, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the values that exist within action face, but I would love to sort of um, zoom in. How do you think about action face faces values? You know, what are they? And, you know, how, how did you go through the process of coming up with them? I have been wanting to start. So, you know, I, I mentioned I'd, I'd started my own company in the 90s and then sure. went into corporate jobs for, you know, 16 years. Um, and the whole time I was sort of, when, when am I going to start another company? You know, and I, I helped other friends start companies and so on and so forth. So I had a lot of time to think about what was the, why am I doing this? You know, I know it's going to be hard. Um, I know it's going to be risky, you know, that, that, that it may not pay off. And, um, so the values really stemmed from, uh, unlike when I, when I was in my twenties and I had no idea <laughs> being in my forties, I was able to say, uh, all I may get out of this in the end is the experience. I hope for a lot more, but all I may get out of this is the experience. So what experience do I want to have? And as I was recruiting my co-founders, I talked to them about that as well. And there were some people who might have been, had good skill matches, but didn't have the same values. What do you want to get out of this experience? And so for us, it was, you know, the, the, the co-founders by and large, you know, I, we always said we could, we could retire in Ohio, but not in California. Like we're, we're kind of in that. Yeah. <laughs> So we, you know, we were able to to put some years into this and do something that really, you know, the kind of thing that you just you'd regret not having tried on your deathbed. Um, and I, I, th I think that was that was the core of our value set, and we did want to create something where we were like, my kids will be proud that their, in my case, dad, you know, uh, you know, created this, and that they grew up seeing it being being created. And I, and my kids are at a certain age where, you know, I really wanted them to, to see what it's like to, you know, hustle, to like create something from nothing. So all of that was part of my value system and, and my co-founders as well, which is we wanted to do this succeed or fail. And we wanted uh, a team, you know, this, this was not, this is not about individual achievement. It was, can we take on something that nobody else has been able to do? Many have tried. Can we do it? Uh, in a way that brings joy to audiences, can we do it in a way where we're we feel great at the end of the journey, wherever it, it leads, that we accomplish something that we're proud of? Um, and for me, there was one more thing, which was, you know, is this something where my kids can uh, watch me go through this process and learn that they can do anything in life if they just put their mind to it? And I, and I think that's been the sort of pervasive value set of the team, you know, that uh, as it's grown. Yeah, that that's awesome. Definitely giving me some some warm fuzzies there. Um, uh, so it, values are a little bit fluffy, right? Like they they are a little bit, um, you know, uh, if you ask someone like, okay, 
Like, do you think it's important to have values? Maybe not everyone would be convinced like, and eh, this company doesn't need to have a set of values. So what, what would you say to an entrepreneur who isn't convinced that uh, having values uh, is important? <laughs> well, the first thing I would say is you have them whether you know it or not. Um, <laughs> you know, there's just no, there, you know, every, every person makes decisions every day. And, um, you know, you can, you can have people in a company who have different values and it will rear its ugly head if you're not aligned. Um, you may never call it ask your values. You may call it, you know, so and so is just being stubborn. <laughs> but, but you know, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a value clash. Um, I, I want to share a really cynical statement that, that a friend of mine made, but uh, I, unfortunately it, it, it does map to a lot of my experiences in corporate America, which is whenever you read the poster on the wall that says what we value, it's all of the things that they do really poorly that they wish they could fix. And so I think all of us who've worked in big companies have become a little, at least skeptical, if not cynical about, you know, values, because we do have that experience of like, no, you, you say you value that. No, you don't. Like if, like my experience here is very different than that poster on the wall. And I just, I actually feel worse having read that poster on the wall because now I kind of wish that were true. And so I think there's, there's a lot of pushback against having company values um, for, for that reason and also because they're hard to articulate. But, but I, I also, you know, come back to you have values, whether, whether you're self-aware or not, you, and you can't operate in life without having a decision-making hierarchy in your head. And so it's good to articulate your values. It's good to do some soul searching. It's great to ask, you know, the people who know you what you value. You know, you may not know, but your your mother, your husband, your child, your best friend, they'll tell you, you know, I, here's what I think you can see. And then compare that with your co-founders, you know, see if if they, they value the same things. Um, it's worth it. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I'm curious if uh, you have any thoughts on like, you know, you're, you're starting this company, you're thinking about vision, mission, and values. I'm curious how formal that process needs to be. Like, do you bring in other people? Do you just have your co-founders? Like, um, I'm, I'm not sure if action face has had a, an exercise like that or not, but I, I'm, I'm curious about that process. Oh, well, the way, the way that we handled it, uh, from the beginning was a little bit different than talking about it as values. But um, with each of the people who, you know, sort of six of us who were, were co-founders, um, we talked to the spouse. You got to talk to the spouse. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, that's, that's where the values conversation comes out because, um, you know, believe it or not, as uncomfortable as it is, um, you know, you, you want to have dinner with the spouse. You want to have your spouse there if you have, if you have a spouse. And, and you want to say, yeah, this could get really hard. This could get really hard. We might we have to get really rich and we may, may be famous and, you know, take private jets. But even if that happens, it could get really hard. And so, you know, how how would you feel if your spouse were coming home late and was, you know, pu pulling his hair out or she was, you know, really anxious and didn't want to talk about it, you know? And, and, and that's where those values conversations do come out of, you know, what's going to trigger those meltdowns? Because we all have them, but what's, what, you know, so what, what do you think is going to trigger Michelle's meltdown or Daniil's meltdown or Kenny's meltdown? We're all, we're all going to have one. Yeah, that's a really interesting take. I've never heard of the, the, the bring everyone together, bring the spouses conversation, but now, now I want to try it. Last topic is something I think you know a little bit about, which is marketing. Um, and I'm, I'm kidding, of course, you come from this rich marketing background before Action Face. So tell us the story of sort of that first marketing strategy for Action Face, you know, after having moved on from Hasbro, um, as you were getting this new sort of thing spin up, how much did you draw from those past experiences versus wanting to do, you know, completely new things with the mar marketing strategy? I drew the the factual knowledge. So, you know, after having had my first company in the nineties, the the biggest lesson I learned. So we you know, we we had some uh tangible success, but but financially uh we folded. And um, you know, my my biggest sort of lesson 
from the 90s was I need to know how things work. There's 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 rules that have been developed by smarter people or, or just larger groups of people over long periods of time. And it's it doesn't I I shouldn't be trying to reinvent those rules when they're out there. So I went to business school and focused on marketing. I, I joined organizations like Mattel and Hasbro and Activision that had, you know, sort of rich histories of amazing marketing. And um you know, if I was going to break the rules, I needed to know the rules. And so, you know, the first thing I would say is that, um, and, and you don't have to do a 16 year odyssey to corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. How, how <laughs> <laughs> consultant. Um, but, but, but the first, the first step was just simply knowing what are the rules and where do those rules break down so that, uh, we as a startup who have, you know, are, are, are by nature at a disadvantage to the large companies, we can we can squeak through the holes that they can't because they're large and lumbering. And the um, so so literally that was that's my first part of my answer is is know the rules and you know it's simple stuff you know uh, if you're if you're selling consumer products to Walmart you know how much uh, inventory should be left at the end of the year uh, what would be considered failure what would be considered success. And then being able to to you know when we're th we were three D printing uh, action figures. One of the things that I knew was a big deal was you never have inventory. In fact, you never even have accounts receivable because you take the credit card before you make the product. And I understood how much value that had. It doesn't have infinite value, but I because I knew the rules, I knew how much value that had. So I'd say know know the rules. They're out there. Um, whatever in industry you're in, you know thousands of people have been down that path before and and there are uh existing processes know them um then the second thing i would say is uh for, first of all uh only follow those rules that help you or set it, set it a little bit differently is the advantage a startup has that a large company cannot follow even though it seems like they should be able to they can't um is you can go, this is the, the customer I want, whether it's a business or an individual, it doesn't matter. It's the customer I want. And this is the value that I offer them. And I'm going to create the most efficient path to let that person know uh, that I have something that satisfies their need. Um, so, you know, the, let me go back a few years. You know, if, if we had tried to do this at Hasbro, you know, in 2014, you couldn't do it from a cell phone back then. But, you know, so we actually were putting, you know, giant scanners at Walmart. But if, if you could do it from a cell phone, you know, Hasbro wasn't in a position to figure out how you market directly to people on their cell phones in 2014. They would have, we would have made TV commercials and sold stuff at Walmart because that's what we knew how to do. Um, you know, when you're a startup, uh, you can do things, and I'll, I'll use a school, school photography example that I, I gave you. Market is expensive. Getting into schools is impossible. The only com companies that can are the school photography companies. What? Our marketing is to give school photographers a huge chunk of the proceeds and let, let them take us into the schools. Um, so we invented a whole marketing and distribution channel that didn't exist before because, uh, because we were small and nimble. Love that. Yeah, that's a really... Uh the moment that you thought of that must have been like light bulb, a big like moment. <laughs> uh, it's, all, it's already giving me ideas since we're working with schools as well. Um, but I guess in the early days when, you know, you're the CEO, you're not CMO. I'm curious how, how much you and your co-founders were involved with setting this marketing strategy um, versus did you have someone who was specifically responsible for marketing? Did you take that on yourself? I'm curious to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, because I come from a marketing background, you know, we I probably went a little longer than I should have without a marketing lead. Eventually, I did, did hire a wonderful marketing lead. Um, and, uh, you know, what I would say to any anyone starting a company is how they go to market strategy. Um, you know, the, in, the, in the military, they teach you that uh, all of your all of your plans are wrong, but you shouldn't. Mm -hmm can't start a campaign without one. Um, 
have the go to market strategy and and it it, it it will propel you don't create your product without it because because the the, the thing is a product is only half a bleach and if you if you start building the product and later think you know what I'm we'll, we'll give it to the marketing team let's not even hire a marketing team we'll just give it to the marketing team once the product is farther along the marketing team is going to say well in order to reach this destination, the bridge actually needs to go over here. And you've built your product part of the bridge to over here. And I don't know how to connect over that giant chasm, you know, with rushing wires, jagged rocks beneath us. Um, so have that go to market strategy before you build the product. Yeah, love that. So um, I'm a new entrepreneur. I'm thinking about having that go to market strategy. What are the things that I need to make sure it covers if I'm building it from scratch? And, you know, how many different marketing tactics can I cram in there? You know, if it's just me who's who's working on it, right? Like, um, so those two things, like, you know, uh, how do I build it? And like, how much does it have to cover? There's there's a model that they'll, you know, they teach in business school, you know, 101, which is the four P's and the three C's. Mm -hmm. So answer the four P's and the three C's. So, so it's uh, product, define your product. And from a marketing perspective, when you're defining your product, define the problem statement. And like I said, if it's entertainment, there's, there's another way to look at it, which is, you know, what, what is it, what is it that, uh, um, what are you serving in people's souls? You know, like I give the Lion King example, you know, it's, it does. It does speak to an, an eternal need in our souls. There were other great movies that also did, but you know, what what is the problem statement, or how does this you know quench the soul? Um, then there's the um, the pricing, and the pricing is really really critical. And it, you know, pricing pe people just think, well, you know, I don't know, nine ninety nine, nineteen ninety nine. You can try them both, see what works. But that's that's not really what pricing is. Pri pricing is the is the outcome of all of the thinking of the the model, which is you know competition and um, and you know willingness to pay. If it's a B two B, you know how are they making money by buying your product? You know, so so pricing is the the end of a long journey of looking at numbers. Um, you know, we we, we when we went uh, to the summer league with uh, the NBA, we started three D scanning people, and eighty two percent of kids who came to our booth. Uh, got an action figure and forgive me for saying this, but we were like, Oh, we're, we're charging too little. Like we need to charge more. Like we shouldn't have that high of a conversion rate. And by the way, if we want to be able to break even as a company, we need the margin. So, you know, pri pricing is, is a, is the outcome, not, not just something that you choose once and, and get it over with. Um, there's um, promotions, which is how you're going to talk about it. It doesn't just mean, you know, 20% off promotions means, how are, you get, how are you going to talk about this? How are people going to find out about it? You know, do you do a, uh, an influencer deal? You know, and and are you going to do these promotions by spending money, or are you going to create partnerships and have those partners, you know, distribute the word about about who you are? Um, and then the last one is called placement, which is weird in today's world. So just just think of it as a gibberish term. But what it means is, um, how does the person who's supposed to buy uh, make that purchase. And, and the reason it's called placement is because it's from a world in which everyone came to retail. So are you buying it at a grocery store? Are you buying it, you know, at like the, distribution the kind of distribution. And, and in today's digital world, even, even distribution can be kind of, you know, misleading. It's just, yeah, yeah. how does that person pay for it? That's, and, and believe it or not, you know, you can get somebody who really wants your product and willing to pay the price and they've heard about it and they still can't figure out how to pay for it. I see it all the time in, you know, digital e-commerce. They're like, well, wait, uh, never mind. So, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that, you know, and, and a lot of times, especially if a digital product, that's where that, that's where that big disconnect comes where I've got this digital product that got them all the way there and, oh, they have to now go click six steps away to get to place you know, two steps away to pay for it. They won't. And that's why you want to think when we talk about go to market strategy, all four of your P's, including placement and then build your product. Wonderful. Awesome. Uh, 
So before we get into last piece here, any final tips on marketing from you as a, a marketing guru with this long ter- career in marketing uh, before we wrap up? <laughs> get get somebody else to call you a marketing guru. It, it's good for your brain. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I think, uh, gosh, what, what are the, the big tips? I think the, my, my biggest tip is is this. When when I was when I was a young entrepreneur and I just I just wanted to take over the world, I didn't go learn the rules because um, I was like the rules are stupid anyway. Let's go let's go make our own rules, um, and that hurt me. And then you know and and all of this comes in raising a family and I'm sure you know people uh, people any any entrepreneur wrestles with this. You start getting successful in your career and you got comfort and you're like oh well, I'm starting to learn the rules. And then, you know, you can, you can kind of get stuck in that. And if you're an entrepreneur at heart, and by the way, if you're not, don't go start a company. But if you're somebody who's like, just needs to be an entrepreneur, leave. And the, the most valuable thing you'll take with you is what's wrong with the rules. Because you're never going to beat the incumbents by playing by the rules. And you're never going to beat the incumbents if you don't even know the rules. The only way that a mark an entrepreneurial marketer can beat the incumbents is to know what rules are being followed that are no longer working. Love that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Kenny. Uh, before we go, I did have a little sort of game that I wanted to play with you. Um, so I have found uh, 10 different slogans from a, a bunch of different companies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a clock here for 30 seconds. I'm going to rapid fire, give you the slogans, and you'll get to guess what that slogan is from. Sound good? That's great. Okay. All right. Let's have some fun. All right. Ready? The happiest place on earth. Disney World. Correct. Uh, Just do it. Nike. Correct. A diamond is forever. Um, uh, De Beers. Yes, correct. Uh, there are some things that money can't buy, but for everything else, there is blank. Mastercard. Correct. Uh, you're in good hands. Uh, uh, oh shoot! It's not Allstate. It's um. Yes, correct. What's in your wallet? Oh. Uh. Shoot. Wait. What is in your city bank? No. Oh. 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 Incorrect. Incorrect. Okay. <laughs> Finger looking good. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken. Correct. So think outside the bun. Taco Bell. Correct. Let's go places. Expedia? Incorrect. Have it your way. Burger King. Correct. All right. Bonus. Make something of yourself. <laughs> Action face. Well done. That was awesome. Uh, so the ones you missed, I think, were uh, Let's Go Places. Yes, Capital One. You got. I think you got it at the end there. And then uh, Let's Go Places was Toyota of all places. Wow. But damn, you, you've got them all down. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks for thanks for playing that game with me. Um, and thank you so much for joining, Kenny. Um, this was an awesome conversation. So many insights to pull out of here from customer needs, partnerships, uh, values, and marketing. Um, and thanks for playing sort of that fun first game. This is the first time we tried that. Did it go? What do you think? Should we keep it or move on? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was, that was great. I love being in the hot seat. (laughs) Great. Well, it was a pleasure to have you on our show and, uh, really appreciate everything. And until next time, see you later. See you later. Thank you so much.